All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI Podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm joined by Heather Nolis, a principal machine learning engineer at T-Mobile. Before we get going, be sure to take a moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. Heather, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Sam. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to chat with you. It's going to be a fun conversation about your journey with machine learning at T-Mobile. But before we jump into that, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your journey in machine learning more broadly. How'd you get into the field? So um, my undergraduate degree is actually in neuroscience. And when I was studying neuroscience, I had this study where I had to keep rats alive for a year and and measure their blood pressure. And at the end of my study, I had this notebook full of data where I very diligently had written every single thing about all of these rats. And I was so excited about my results and I gave them to the PI of my lab and I was like, here we go. And she was like, great, now you can pack this, pass this off to our analytics team who will analyze your results. And being like a micromanagey person who likes to know everything, I almost blew a gasket. And they're like, what? <laughs> My data? Right. I'm like, I'm perfectly qualified. And she's like, are you? And I was like, I will become qualified. Watch. And so I went, <laughs> I took my first Python courses. I took some bioinformatics courses. And at that point, I was like, what I really want to do. Well, I kind of fell in love with computer science at that moment and imagined I would end up with a PhD at in molecular neuropharmacology doing big data that way. Um, So I went to get a master's in computer science. And while I was getting that master's, I started working at T-Mobile. And while I was there, the team that I was on said, oh, we're thinking about about doing some AI proof of concepts. And my hand just shot straight up in the air. I was like, big data is the whole reason I started programming. It's like all of my side projects are NLP, like, please pick me. And so so that's kind of the story of how I got into doing this professionally. Awesome. I think we're going to have to call this episode machine learning, comma, cooler than rats. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is, though. Yeah. Uh, and so um, I guess we can start from the beginning then. You were there. Uh, was that was this proof of concept the beginning of all ML at all of T-Mobile or in your particular corner of T-Mobile? Yeah. So what had been happening is I think the same thing that many large companies had where you had huge data warehouses, lots of analytics, people doing decision science to put numbers into PowerPoints to help executives make really smart decisions. But we didn't have any real time models and we weren't doing anything that I thought was super cutting edge. So at This was five years ago, so at the time it was deep learning at all. Um, And so my team's goal in this proof of concept was to put T-Mobile's first real-time deep learning model into production. And that's kind of where we've we've staked our home. It's like we do things real-time, we focus on on more cutting-edge style solutions, and we don't do a lot of that like batch analytics. We are the the real-time AI team. Got it. And how big was the the team at the beginning? So the initial proof of concept, there was me and one other engineer, and we were like, we need a we need a very strong data leader in the mix. So we we brought in my wife Jacqueline Nolis, who has been on your podcast before, um, and so she helped us with that original proof of concept. And so it was the three of us that took that first API into production, um, and then, wow. So how that happens, kind of a cool story. I, if I can digress. How we even got to do this proof of concept was that T-Mobile has like an internal Shark Tank innovation round. So we pitched all these ideas and then they gave us $100,000 in three months to pull something off. Um, okay. And so that's when we developed our first uh, our first NLP deep learning model. We got it released into production. And then at the end of the innovation round, you pitch to executives trying to get them to buy your product forever. And we were bought. So after that, then we said, okay, now we have to build a full scale product around this and and get it in front of our front line to actually be used in contact centers and scale it. And so uh, maybe we're going further down the the rat hole coming back to rats again, but like how was that $100,000 spent was that like salaries or were there other hard costs associated with this POC? It was mostly salaries. Some of it was also training because we had the question of should we be building this stuff ourselves? Of course I think that. Like um But we wanted to make sure that we weren't doing T-Mobile a disservice by not considering a lot of these like big vendors that claim to offer intent modeling as well. So some of it was in in trials with those sorts of things. And then a lot of the rest was just uh, staffing and research. And so talk about the 
this thing that you pitched the, 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 the products, what, what, what was it seeking to solve? Uh, what was the use case? So, so the team that I was on was focused on building all of the software plumbing that connects the experts in contact centers solving T-Mobile problems to the customers that are trying to talk to us via digital means. So this is mostly Facebook, Twitter, our app, however they're typing to us. Um, we built the plumbing for all of that. And so when it came time to say, well, T-Mobile wants to do some AI stuff, what should we do? Of course, I say we are sitting on top of tons of conversation transcripts. We have all of this data of our customers telling us exactly what their problem is. Um, and so our very first um, taught, like just proof that we could even build a deep learning model was just a simple intent model. So we had 88 different intents that we identified or topics really throughout T-Mobile that people are really calling in about. And so it was developing and deploying that first model. And the product that we stood up around it was one messaging expert who's responding to Twitter, Facebook, um, app messages, web messages, might have 10 different windows open at one time because these chats are asynchronous. And context switching is really difficult. So actually showing the topic of the conversation in whatever quick facts we can pull up about this person's account related to that topic is super, super useful because then they don't have to prep themselves. As soon as a customer comes in, we've already got their first message. We've calculated what their intent is. They're coming in. They're looking to talk about upgrading their phone. We've actually went out, pulled the data to say what phone they have now. And then we've uh, surfaced links that say, in case you don't know how to upgrade someone's phone, here's actually how you do it. And so that's our first product that we came out with. And it we called it Expert Assist. But now Blank Assist is uh, industry standard terminology. But I will confidently say we coined that one. <laughs> <laughs> and so what were your, you, you had a, a bunch of data, um, was your data already, uh, I presume it wasn't already labeled for something or no, um, like, what was it? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you asked about that. Cause when we talk about where did that first hundred thousand dollars go, so much of it went to the most expensive labeling job of all time. Um, T-Mobile's very into customer privacy. So no way were they going to let us have an external vendor label our data. And at the time they were like, we don't even want you to bring on anyone new because they might not have the business knowledge to accurately label data. So we, we paid data scientists to label our first 20,000 conversations um, manually, which yeah, most expensive labeling job wow. of all time. We now have an internal labeling team of five data annotators. So much different story now, but. Um, and so what were some of your first steps in kind of building this out? The, the first thing that we said is we wanted to try unsupervised learning, right? We didn't want to have to take a supervised deep learning approach if we could do something with unsupervised learning. But using LDA and almost any unsupervised approach that we could, it really came up with that. There are two major types of conversations that happen in T-Mobile. About 80% of them are about the topic T-Mobile and about 20% are about the topic <laughs> phones. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that's where we said, okay, I don't know about this. And I actually, I found a statistician. Even if you set your number of classes to be, you know, much bigger than that, like they still, it's just different ways to say phone and different ways to say T-Mobile. Yes. Or different types of phone. And that's not necessarily business actionable, right? Like we weren't seeing any business actionable classes shake out. And I, I talked to another team who has managed to do this sort of modeling in an unsupervised way, but it involved like a Rube Goldberg machine of data pipelines to get somewhere. And so we said, we don't, we don't have time to think about that. Let's at this point, let's label 20,000 conversations and see what we can do. And you were ultimately hoping for your intents to these topics to pop out of this uh, unstructured, not un unsupervised process. Yeah. And the thing that was, was really important is because we wanted to do real time stuff Topics of like phone, T-Mobile, even the type of phone someone's talking about, not useful real time to an expert because you have a human being sitting there also listening to the conversation. Like they they very well know that it's still about iPhone, you know. So any of the any of the classes that we create, we want to make sure there's actually business actions we can take there. And so the unsupervised thing didn't pan out. And so what'd you move to? So after that, that's when we decided to do supervised learning, but then we came to the problem that everybody has, which is what is our taxonomy going to be? Um, like every legacy company, we had taxonomies that existed. I believe that each taxonomy should be created for the specific problem that it's looking to solve um, instead of shoehorning as many, as many meanings as you can to classes that are already created. And so 
we had to spend a lot of time advocating against some uh, taxonomies used for post colony analytics. Um, so I had to prove that the, the topics that we need real time are not the same things that are useful after the call to, to say what people are generally talking about. And that took a very long time and was very difficult. So um, proving wow. that we needed to actually <laughs> develop our own taxonomy for, for this problem, very difficult because from a business perspective, it's introducing confusion. We have one dashboard. We know what all these things mean. Please don't let us make us learn another one. But after we won that argument, uh, we asked our product and business people to go basically lock themselves in a room and come out with, with some sort of hierarchical taxonomy for us. And then we refined that taxonomy during our labeling process. So since we had data scientists having to label stuff, we were able to point out when classes were going to be easily confused based on the language being used or whenever they called out a class that was like, nobody ever talks about that. So an example is they had five high level categories for what different topics would be about in T-Mobile and somebody, one of the categories was network. And customers don't have a lot of nuanced language to speak about the network. They really just say, hey, I have a question about my network or my signal. Um, so they had spent time creating like 16 subclasses of network conversations for us to have to come back and say, you wasted your time. People really only, our customers only vaguely speak about network because they're not engineers. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And so going back to this idea of, you know, the building the case for your own taxonomy, in retrospect, was there a, a silver bullet? Like, how did you win that argument? Or for someone else who's maybe embroiled in that now, like what? Yeah. Well, the first, that? the first thing I will say is if you're going to have this argument one time, you're probably going to have to have it a hundred times. So for me, like I won this argument once and then I've had to win, win it every time since. And what I keep going back to is I, I think that business users often forget that modeling is kind of the easy part of data science. So when we talk about creating new models, new taxonomies, they get very nervous. But for me, what takes a long time on our projects is figuring out the business case. Can we actually bring value if I build this model? I can build shiny models for forever that sound really cool that aren't making anyone money. Um, and so that's what takes a long time. So one of the things that's really helped me is, is being able to document that and saying, you're scared of us changing the taxonomy because you're afraid it will take time. That's not the bulk of the time. So you don't need to be scared about that. And then the second thing is just trying to drive home a culture of small models for small problems, build things specific for your use case to answer it exactly. Otherwise, you will get a deteriorated product. And so there's that. We also took all of the enterprise taxonomies and lined them up against each other. And I was able to show places where I needed a piece of information that the old taxonomies did not have inside of it. Um, so a good example there might be sometimes when people can't pay their bill, they set up a payment arrangement. And sometimes they can't pay their payment arrangement. And for me, that can't pay payment arrangement is very important. Um, and I had that as a separate class. And in the other thing, it was all just billing. And it's like, I actually like billing might be useful for a PowerPoint when you need to know how much time call center experts are spending on billing, but it's not useful for helping an expert solve a call about billing while it's happening. Yeah. And, and that yeah. kind of like light bulb moment. But I've had to, every time we go to build a new model, I do have to have this fight again. And so I have like a, a pre-planned deck that just kind of lines it all out. Mm, nice. So talk more about this idea of uh, small models versus uh, big Uber models. Yeah. Um, so our very first model that we released, I mentioned it, it had 88 different classes and was kind of a disaster. Um, it still exists. It's still running. Like, like it's still running. We are doing the, a giant refactor on it right now. Um, but I learned a lot in doing that. So the first thing was we were really dedicated to doing a representative sample of the data. So we did not subsample anything. It was like a truly representative sample of conversations we labeled. And so we labeled this, but it turns out that many business actionable things are small and rare. So great that I picked the 88 most frequent topics, but they actually need uh, when somebody is requesting a password update. Um, and that's nowhere in, in my 88 topics. And so that's when we started saying, well, if we need if we need password questions, let's build specific models and then talk about how we can write to, route to those specific submodels if necessary. Um, but just because 
it's it's kind of difficult. I'll I'll give you an example of my favorite small model that we have. That's a natural language model. Um, and I like it because it's an example of a time that we removed a chat bot from people by being smart. So when you messaged us, we used to have. Well, thank you for those of us who didn't want to use that chat bot. Right. Yeah, that's why I like it. Um, I built chat bots before. I, I think that there's a place for them. But sometimes when you can get away without it, don't. Um, but so it was whenever you would message us for the first time, like if you were normally someone who called T-Mobile, but this time you're texting us, we would send you a picker that said, are you a customer? Select yes or no. And the reason why we had to do that is some, some you would think T-Mobile knows your phone number. You should know if we're a customer or not. But we actually don't in many situations, depending on which app you're coming to us from. And what we quickly realized is like asking people yes or no there is very silly because we can really tell from their first message whether they're a customer or not. If they message us, they say, I need help with my bill. Nobody who's not a customer needs help with their bill. But if they say, I want to switch to T-Mobile, nobody who is a customer says that. And so we were able to just take the first messages and the picker responses that were already selected and build a really quick, like shallow neural network between the two and eliminate that picker for 80% of customers who chat with us. Uh, going back to the previous example, you had this 88 class model and you're kind of in the process of refactoring it out to smaller models kind of along this ideal. Um, what do you hope to replace it with? You know, you would think the router is still a class, an 88 class classifier. If it's a, a learn router, you know, are you looking at heuristic approaches as opposed to learned approaches or? So for us, one of the major things was that when we, when we created this out of this representative sample of data, we aren't able to get those classes that business users are asking us for. So if they're asking us for something that occurs 0.001% of the time, and we keep pulling this representative sample of data, we will have to label millions of conversations before we have enough to get the enough data to even get what they want to show up. So one of the, one of the major things in our refactor that we're focused on is reducing the number of pieces of labeled data, we need to create these new intenser topics. And so we are using, um, we still have the same, well, we've done some taxonomy refactoring since then, but we are shifting from our own in-house neural network to using Distillbert from Hugging Face as a baseline and then retraining on that. Um, and then we're able to reduce the number of labeled data pieces we need per class dramatically. Before it would be five to 10,000, and now we're at 1,000, um, which makes us be faster for our business. So that that's our the major thing that we're focused on. The other thing that's kind of changed since we released is we originally um, released our models in R. So it was just R in a Docker container as an API, <laughs> and, and they ran pretty okay. Like, uh, we were doing 2 million returns a day, but we are, this kind of is where we switched to voice. So we were building this all in messaging. We had to have 20 containers of our R model, um, but it was serving two, 2 million responses a day. And the T-Mobile, the business, they came to us and they said, it's really cute what you're doing here for all of the customers contacting us in messaging, but 90% of care traffic is in voice. So they say, Okay. And they're like, so we want you to build this where it will work for people who call in as well. Say, so, okay, well, we can't have over 200 pods running of our topic model when this goes to production. What and, do you mean? Just sprinkle some <laughs> Kubernetes on there. Right. Like, it's the most expensive <laughs> of all time. Well, and the thing is, is that messaging conversations tend to be pretty succinct. If you're chatting with somebody, you're direct on a voice conversation, you're going to talk about the weather and your kids. And so it, even 200 is not a good example because it almost just depends on how chatty people are. And so that's when we said, OK, we, we need to do something smarter with how we're serving these models. And what we ended up doing is they are now deployed as Java Spring Boot services that run Python as a sidecar. and. They are. We, they have both API endpoints, but then they're also Kafka consumer producers. So we use Kafka streaming architecture because we have so many predictions that we're making at this point. Was Java is Java just an engineering standard there that folks were comfortable with running in prod or? Yes, like we have people who like Java, but we did try in Python first. Because like we're like, our data scientists know Python. Let's do this in Python. At the time when we were doing it, the Python streaming libraries for Kafka were not mature enough to do the joins that we need to do to get all of our data to be like 
filtered correctly. And so we we ended up switching to Java because of that. But it's something that we do look at every once in a while to see how mature those Kafka streaming libraries for Python have become. Because uh, once they can do very great streaming joins, then we would love to get Java out of our stack. I don't feel the need to keep languages around just because they're, they're, they look good enterprise-wide, but... Yeah, there's a whole other rat hole maybe around streaming joins. Uh, wh where did the complexity come in there? Well, at the time, we were trying to build a dashboard for the business operations center that helped them with staffing. So I'll, I, I'll kind of set it up where we have all sorts of bells and whistles on networks that tell you whatever those towers are going down. But no matter how fast we make those, we will never be faster than our customers who are going to tell us the second there is any problem. And when cell phone towers go down, people flood to messaging. You want to do time. like some kind of event correlation across all these things to try to figure out what is the actual thing happening? Even that or even being able to tell the operations center before the network engineering team has figured out what is going on, right? So network oh, engineering team, they might it. get a blip. There's an issue. They're still investigating, but we can read in customers' words. And we, we know where that customer usually is using their phone because they have a primary place of use address. And so we can make some assumptions there. Um, they also wanted us to look at the topics that people were coming in on and say, are there any anomalies? Because... We had, like, if there's a billing systems issue, it could take a while for us to figure that out. But our customers might be telling us right this second. And if we just look at the at how often customers are coming in with billing issues, maybe we can predict some of those downstream issues. We were also looking at it for staffing. So if we can predict how many conversations we're going to get and what sort of topics we're going to have, how do we make sure that our contact centers are staffed appropriately? Um, and it was in doing that, they had a bunch of different filtering they wanted to do on that dashboard, like click a state and then see all the topics. They also wanted us to do trending topics for those states. So unsupervised utterances we were pulling out of there. And it was in all of that clicking that like the Python was not performing well on the joins to do that type of filtering. Even taking a step back, going from text to speech it sounds like yeah, you know, there's a ton of complexity that I'm imagining is introduced in in going from uh in going from the one to the to other. Can you talk a little bit about how you dealt with that? Yeah. So I'll I'll tell a personal story first because I think it's really fun. I I had worked in NLP but only on text. And we had one other machine learning engineer who was our speech specialist. When we finally got gr green light to start working on speech, she was like, Heather, here's here's an initial reading. I'm gonna be out for two weeks you study speech to text. And when I come back, we'll have a conversation. Okay. And she she came back and I sat down and I was like, so I've been thinking a lot about tropical semi rings because you can use them to optimize a lot of speech to text calculations. And she just looked at me and said, you've gone on the wrong path. I was like, oh, <laughs> she's like, you will never need any of that math. And I was like, oh, whoops. Um, so that was my first lesson. And like everything here is different. There's a lot that you have to think about. Well, first, from the from the technical perspective, with text, a computer gets text. How, how does your computer get a phone call? I didn't know the answer. I do now. But you like the signals that phones are sig are sending are like, I think, uh, RTP and STP streams. And those are not web sockets or anything that a computer can consume. So you actually have to take those phone streams and route them through something like Zoom that can take computer calls to make them into phone calls and vice versa, use pieces of that to actually convert the audio streams into web sockets. So that way we can even get the audio to start. And so at the, that point, it was kind of mind blowing. Um, and then in the, in the speech space at all, you have to start thinking about not only the language that customers are saying to you, but the acoustic environment that they are in and how that's impacting the transcription. And for us, most speech to text modeling that's done is for, well, it's either done by, it's done on data that is men reading audiobooks slowly is how it's trained. And then it's normally trained for people speaking slowly in their acoustically nice living room. But that's not our customers. Like our customers are in line at Starbucks and they are trying to do this on their lunch break. Uh, like they are yelling and their dogs are barking in the background. And so figuring all of that out and learning about that and about 
the way that different accents work and how we can try and make this this technology we're building work equitably for all of our all of our customers has been like there's nothing like it in the text world whatsoever. You don't have the features. You started talking about the the compute environment pods and all that stuff. Um, how are you running? Is this uh, GPU heavy workload? Uh, where is it running? Yeah. So our transcription stuff is incredibly GPU heavy. Our our topic modeling less so, but the transcription is. And so we started out with a like an on prem provider specific for GPU hardware because at the time we were getting in like ridiculously good latency because that that's one thing that's really important is a lot of times speech to text it doesn't matter if it's slow um because you might be transcribing stuff for post call analytics but for us if we're trying to build experiences that pop up to help an expert solve a problem we have to be faster than the human being hearing this sentence so if someone's like i need to set up i i, I would love to pay my bill and I say, great, I'm here to help you pay your bill. Let me dig around. And then I click the app, I start to pay their bill, and then a pop-up comes up and says, would you like to pay their bill because our transcription is slow? I've created- That sounds like Clippy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so so latency is like super important to us to build trust. And so we originally had an on-prem provider because we were getting good latency. And we took it to AWS and we were like, hey, like, can you, what can you guys do here? At the time, their latency was not very good. Um, but since then, we actually have been able to switch to a cloud provider. So we do use AWS to do this. Um, but we have our own internal hosted Kubernetes that is then hosted on AWS, if that makes sense. Okay. But we do. It is a GPU heavy workload. So we do have them running on GPU instances. For our topic models, right now we're in the process of converting those to AWS Inferentia chips, um, which we're still we're still waiting to see what the actual improvement will be from using the Inferentia chips. This is maybe going back uh, a bit, but you uh, you mentioned that the with the current version of this, I think, in, as part of the the text to speech uh, based system transition, you went from something to Distillbert, like pre-trained Distillbert and fine tuning that. What was the, the thing before? It was a, a hand a handcrafted network using Keras that was a, a like a shallow convolutional neural network. Okay. <laughs> so very bespoke. Right, exactly. And so um it takes a lot to say we we're we're not going to do that anymore. But we still do like bespoke neural networks for other problems, but for our giant topic model, Distillbert's good. We in our first our first experiment with Distillbert, we just like pulled it off the shelf and took our already labeled data and trained against it. And after one epic, we saw very good results. So we were like, okay, this is probably the direction that we're going if it can get this in just one epic. And have you had to um do anything special to to get it to deal with the number of classes that you're working with? Um, not so far, but as I kind of mentioned, we're we're in the process of maybe breaking apart the models into a bunch of different submodels and having having a better router at the top. Um, so we might end up doing that. We have zero interest in introducing new classes into this model because it's it's so old and giant. We one of our data scientists calls it the Toyota Corolla of models. Like it just, it's it's reliable. It does what it does, but no one's super impressed by it. So we want to kind of let it continue, do what it's doing. Um, but any of the new type of topic modeling that we're looking to do, we are we are building other models to do it. And we're, we, we will never have an 88 class model again because maintaining it is awful. And I, I don't know if you answered the question about what, what you're anticipating to use for that router. Oh, yeah. So we don't know yet. Um, it really depends on the type. Well, it depends on the type of experiences that that our, our care stakeholders want. So um, I think a like for the first go that we have, we have two different experiences that we are rolling out. One is about network and one is about customers who are dissatisfied. And we think it's just going to be a logistic regression, right? Like just which one do they go to dissatisfied or network or otherwise, maybe, which we can get to that. Um, but we're not sure how that's going to scale. It really depends on their roadmap. So we've got to be in tight collaboration. 
So the idea then is that um, as opposed to kind of this flat 88 classes, you're going to have a kind of a hierarchical taxonomy and you just have to figure out which of the branch which of the handful of branches they need to be routed to, and then you'll do the kind of fine-grained classification lower down? Yes, yeah. So it will be a hierarchical taxonomy. We will pass it off. And then within each of those general experiences that we're trying to roll out, we want to have like a proper like state engine where we have intent being recognized, and then we're kind of deciding what to pop out for the for the expert next using an LSTM of some sort. Um, so that's kind of the future vision that we're building where we're able to like walk experts through these flows smartly using the NLP that we're doing to check off any checks or fill in any boxes for them as they go through these workflows. And now there are tons of these off the shelf kind of intent engines and chatbot engines and conversational AI tools. Um, how do you think about kind of the build versus buy decision? So what what I tell my stakeholders always is if there's something out there that honestly works better than what I would build, I would love to buy it. But I'm very hesitant to put something that works less well than what we have in front of our experts. And so I can give a very easy example here, which is recently we had a vendor solution that we were looking at that um, identified promises and commitments inside of conversations. And that's very exciting because we always want to know what our experts are promising our customers, what we're committing to. And if they call back in later and they say, you promised me, we want to be able to say, yes, we did promise you. You're right. I'm sorry. Um, but when we dug into it, the out of the box accuracy was like 53%. So we said, okay, let, let's dig into some more of these. And they didn't make any sense to us. They weren't what we would consider promises or commitments um, from a business perspective. Whereas we put one of our data scientists on the task for one week and we can come up with something with about 80% accuracy because we know what we're looking for. And that's the very hard story that we've been telling our stakeholders over and over again is that, yes, general language models work very well for general English. But we don't really speak English at T-Mobile. Like we speak T-Mobileese. There are so many words in the English language that will never appear. Um, and there are so many things that we are going to talk about that are completely different. So an example I like to use is the word jump has a literal different meaning at T-Mobile because jump is the name of our insurance plan. So like it's an argument for custom embeddings. And so for me, I think it's totally appropriate to take an off the shelf solution to prove a concept out and see if there's any value. But then I always like to ask, can you do something uh, cheaper and better? And so I'll, I can kind of speak about our speech to text here where we originally did roll out with vendor partners. So we did a huge RFP. Every major uh, speech to text provider in the world that exists, I have reviewed them. And we launched our original proof of concept with AWS Transcribe. Uh, and so we did use a vendor, but Immediately, once we had the audio data, we started looking at open source solutions and saying, what can we do on our specific data? And the word error rate on our data that we have right now is nine. State of the art's like seven to five, like state of the art for like standard slow English is seven to five. And our word error rate is nine. Anytime we test a vendor product against it, it is 18, human, like 18-ish and you lose measurable meaning after 20. And so I just kind of all the time, even when vendors say, we have we have state of the art speech to text, when you run it against our calls, it's not because our acoustic environments are very strange. The language that we use is different. We have a lot of strange factors um, in our business. And so just trying to reiterate constantly, like, like, yes, the numbers that you're seeing in the media are great if we were Wikipedia, you know, like if this, but we're not, our conversations are not Wikipedia. So mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, dealing with accents, for example, um, and, you know, that representative of being representative of other biases that you might encounter. How do you approach that whole, um, that whole spectrum of, of factors? Yeah. So, so for me, when I think about it, if I'm building efficiency tooling for the front line, I'm, I'm trying to make them smarter, better at their jobs. Most contact centers compensate people by how happy the customers are afterward, how quickly they solve calls, how quickly they go through them. And so then I'm thinking it is so incredibly important for me personally to build 
models that serve everyone equally. Because if not, if I'm building models that help some people, that's literally going to increase their paycheck. And if I'm building models that don't help other people, that's going to literally decrease their paycheck. And so we talk about that all the time on our team. Like it is, it is the most important thing to us. And so we actually, we have a full-time AI ethics specialist who she's an engineer and she's focused mostly on our voice models. And so there's a data set called the Mozilla Common Voice data set, which is anybody can go, you can speak and transcribe your audio, tag it with your demographic data. So we started with that, testing our models against Mozilla Common Voice data set. We found it to be pretty insufficient in some striking ways. So an example is they have multiple different Asian accents listed in the data set. Uh, for Africa, they just have African, as wow. if there are yeah, as if there aren't multiple <laughs> African accents. Um, and so we used them originally to to kind of get a get a benchmark there. But what we're working on really now is building our own T-Mobile version of that. Like, what is the data set that accurately represents all of our customers and all of our employees that we can use to measure different word error rates against and see how we can improve. And the, one of the reasons why this is super important to us is our speech to text solution is very hard to scale. Like um, by the time we are at full scale, we will be the largest speech to text for contact centers in the world. Um, or at least that was true a year ago. I haven't checked since, but, but so it's very hard to scale. And so we are right now live with 7,000 agents, but we plan to be live to everybody in the U S by the end of 2022 and everybody globally by the end of 2023. And so, for me, what's very important is before we roll out to global partners, so anybody who is answering the phone who is from any other country for T-Mobile, I need to make sure that my models work well for them. And so we have a huge focus on the, those specific areas and collecting that data to make sure that I, we will not release models that do not perform within an acceptable window of, of standard in this situation. And so that's really kind of how we've done it. But there's not there's not a good open source data set that has all the data that we need to accurately bias test it. So we're just having to curate our own. You, you've been talking about speech to text, speech to text. Is the transcript an actual product that you need or is the transcript an input to downstream things? And that's kind of a, you know, the next question is, you know, do you think about like some Uber, you know, deep network that goes straight from speech to intense and skip the whole text thing? I'm glad that you asked that because that was my dream originally. <laughs> when we said speech to text, okay. I was like, and we're going to build intent modeling directly on audio signals. And that's when my speech scientist was like, Heather, no. I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. She's like, the computation for that would be so ridiculous. But so what our speech to text mostly does right now is it's, pow it's powering a product we call auto memo. After the end of every call, our experts have to spend three to five minutes typing out everything that it was about. And we said, actually, oh, we think we can summarize some of this. Doing that took a very long time. It turns out that human speech is not very good to even do an extractive summary from. So like not only- Summarization can you not is still hard. <laughs> right. Well, and especially <laughs> when people speak, we're not very succinct. So that took a very long time to figure out what that product will look like. And it is a combination of we add the top three, what we call call drivers, like the things that we think made them actually call in to the memo. And then we also have it where experts can click and view the entire transcript if they need to dig in for some reason. Um, I don't love showing the full transcript because I'm like, we're going to make mistakes and people are going to give us feedback and it will be embarrassing. Um, but so far, so good. The experts seem to really like that. And we're, we're even toying around with the concept of if they can see the transcript in real time while they're talking, could they flag things for correction? So for us to go in and correct the transcripts later. But so, but the ultimate dream is that the speech to text is powering like all of these Jarvis style pop-ups just, just automatically drive and do all the silly things for the expert while they can just focus on having the human conversation. The thing my robots will never be good at probably, but. Mm -hmm. And what are you using for summarization now? Um, that's why I say it's a, it's an it's another internal model that just pulls out these three call drivers. But we did over six months on an extractive summary thing. Um, the thing is, is that it's very hard to get it to be business actionable. It would come up with stuff like, it'd be like, I really like my phone plan. I want a new phone, you know, like, and that's not a good summary because a good summary for that is upgrade call. But yeah. One thing that's kind of interesting is a lot of, um, 
uh, maybe it's not interesting. Maybe it's just expected. But you know, you haven't mentioned the the terms, but a lot of what you're experiencing uh, connects to a theme that we've been exploring on the podcast over the past few weeks, couple months, uh, data centric AI. Like you started with this heavy focus on models, but a lot of the things that you ran into required that you refine the data, refine the data. And, um, is that a, does that term resonate for you or is that something that you've, you've looked at at all? Yeah, yeah. I I would say that I know that there's like a official like uh, data driven AI movement, and I would say I think we're largely in alignment, right? Like like don't don't go creating AI for the sake of doing a stunt, um, and and make sure that what you're doing actually delivers value. And so yeah, I do think it resonates. Um, can you you can you talk a little bit more about the um the ML ops aspect of keeping all these models up and running and in production, like what kind of platforms and tooling have you built out to support all this? Yeah. So our team is like so focused on product development that we honestly have not done our due diligence in many ways for model maintenance. And so right now we have like, um, we do have model audits that will happen. So we have some lambdas that automatically put a percentage of conversations into AWS Ground Truth for our data annotation team to actually check on. And then we have some reporting that can be done around that. But for the most part, we haven't seen significant enough data drift to to touch our models, except for when uh, T-Mobile and Sprint merge together, because all of a sudden Sprint is no longer a competitor. When people are talking about Sprint, they're talking about us. And so that required, that was Ah. significant enough data drift for us to retrain everything. Um, But for the most part, we are just like it works until somebody tells us otherwise, Um, which which is not the best strategy. But Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and otherwise, uh, it sounds like you're fairly uh, invested in AWS's various offerings for from a tech perspective. Although you did say you you kind of built your own world your own Kubernetes cluster that you just happen to be hosting on AWS. Yeah, yeah. And so I would say we are interested in AWS's offerings only in their bare components. So we are rarely a consumer of like a cognitive services service. Like we, our team doesn't really buy those. We mostly build our own models and we have them end up deployed on AWS. But um, the, we recently moved to Google. And in my spare time when I'm doing side projects, I use GCP for most of my stuff. Um, and so hopefully we will have a tightener partnership with Google in the future. Maybe I'll be talking about TPUs instead of inferentia chips, but we'll see. <laughs> and do you have opinions on you know, either um, of their like data science workbench you know, environments, SageMaker, or Vertex? So SageMaker, I feel like it works. Like it's fine. I feel like I what I really like about working in GCP is they separate um, compute and storage completely all the time. And so you always have to really think about your compute and your storage. I also like that it's like a push architecture. So you're always waiting for pushes instead of other things. So that's why I like doing software. Um, but as far as like the different platforms for individual development, I feel like it's all mostly fine. Like it's all, it's all kind of apples to apples. We end up having to build so many custom components on top of whatever we're doing. Um, it ends up the same. We, we've done trials with Azure Databricks too. So like Databricks through Microsoft Azure. And we're like, we already have an AWS bill. So I guess we'll just keep doing that one for now. But <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Uh, any thoughts on kind of, you know, future directions, what's next, uh, on your roadmap? Yeah. Yeah. So there's definitely the, uh, rolling out speech to everybody, making sure that it works great for all of our customers. We also have some interesting stuff potentially coming up with legal, you know, on the phone, people always read you terms and conditions and you have to accept when, when you are audited to show to the auditors that that happened, you have to like pull conversations and show them like audio recordings. They're thinking, why can't we just build a dashboard that does a cosine similarity between terms and conditions and what was actually said and said, yes, they read them and then they agreed. So that's one of our really quick wins that's coming up that I'm, I'm pretty excited about, but 
for the most part, everything that we do is trying to move to this dream of the autonomous desktop. So like I said, so our care experts can sit back, chat, have the human interaction while we are taking notes for them, opening the right apps at the right time. Um, and so what I'm hoping is we are standing up a very robust uh, click tracking infrastructure for our care desktop. And I'm excited to predict clicks, right? Like to open windows at the right time, do things of that nature that's outside of the natural language intent stuff that we've been focused on. We also are doing a bunch of stuff in what we call the virtual retail space. Lots of people want to buy phones and don't want to go into a store. So we're like, how can we use AI to help salespeople sell? And that's like helping create positioning statements, helping them write fit accessories to a phone that this particular customer is trying to buy. So that, that recommendation space, we've also just begun to dip our toes into. That's very exciting. And then measuring the impact of recommendation systems is a whole separate bag that I'm excited to unpack. But. Nice, nice. Well, Heather, thanks so much for taking the time to share a bit about what you're up to. Very cool, uh, uh, very cool anecdotes and, and lots of interesting lessons learned in there. Yeah, thank you. It was nice to chat.